So the title of this talk is Dear Reader, the novel's call to perform. Hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. Baudelaire, au lecteur. Reader, I call you hypocrite, my similar, my brother. Hypocrite because your ostensible passivity is a pretense. It's you who's in charge. My similar because the hypocrite is also me, addressing you indirectly, rarely deigning to speak your name, calling out to you while I act like I'm speaking into the wind. My favorite character in a novel is almost always the dear reader. He's the most seductive, the most desirable, the most powerful. Or is he a she, ma soeur, hypocrite lectrice? She's also mysterious that way. Do we pretend or does she pretend that she's merely receiving the text? Of course, the reader's never passive. The dear reader is dear to the writer precisely because without him or her, the book remains inanimate, an object unperformed. Lyric poetry like Baudelaire's is, we are told, a spontaneous outpouring of emotion in solitude. But because emotion is often provoked by relations to others, and particularly by love, poetry often seems to evoke a beloved, sometimes addressed in the second person, which, when read, implicates, hails, summons the reader in the lover's place. It can happen even when the poet acknowledges his aloneness, as in John Ashbery's heartbreaking poem, The Room, and I quote, why do I tell you these things? You are not even here. But in that moment of the call, you are here, there, in Ashbery's room. You are the lover. But what about other literary forms? What about the novel? What is the novel reader's call to perform? Unlike lyric poetry, narrative fiction and performance would seem to stand in stark contrast to one another. The novel as a genre offers certain possibilities, point of view, intermediary voice, the invocation of the individual reader's capacity for imagination and fleshing out the story that performance might seem to foreclose. By the same token, live performance would seem to offer the possibilities of sensory, non-linguistic engagement and ephemerality, the very things that reading would appear to lack. But maybe that's the point. Maybe this tells you just why novel reading is such a performative act. The novelist Kurt Vonnegut suggested that the reader of a novel is not actually analogous to the audience member attending a performance, but to the, but to the performer, him or herself. And I quote, to expect somebody to read a book, he said, is like having someone arrive at a concert hall and be immediately handed a violin and told to go up on stage. This understanding of the performative nature of reading would seem to suggest that any literal performance extraneous to a literary text would be superfluous. The performance is intrinsic to the act of reading the text. This is part of why certain dedicated readers resist the dramatization of literary texts. I think it was just this morning that we were talking about the disappointment when novels are translated into film. And yet the extreme performativity of the act of reading fiction is precisely what was dramatized in the theater company Elevator Repair Service's recent beautiful production, Gats. Hardly a staged reading of The Great Gatsby, even though every word of the book, including he said and she said was uttered. In the production, the actor Scott Shepard enters the stage sparsely decorated with the dilapidated furnishings and equipment of a ramshackle office. He could be an insurance salesman or a real estate agent or a small potatoes accountant. He's carrying his coffee in a paper cup. He's apparently the first one to get to the office this morning and when he tries to boot up his aged compu desktop computer, something goes wrong. He gives it a couple of half-hearted slaps, but they fail to wake up the machine. So he pulls a paperback <clears throat> book out of the top drawer of his desk and starts to read it out loud, The Great Gatsby. His entry into the novel isn't particularly thrilling. He has the non-committal tone of somebody just thumbing through the opening pages of a book. But as the narration progresses, he becomes more animated. 
One by one, his co-workers begin to arrive, seemingly nonplussed by his reading. And slowly, very slowly, the dilapidated office begins to transform before our eyes. Not the set, but the way it's populated. Shepard's dreary colleagues begin to insert lines of dialogue and participate in the fictional world unfolding from the pages of the novel. Eventually, Shepard puts the book down. Astonishingly, the actor has memorized each and every word of the novel, and for the next six hours, he and the rest of the company play it out with such vitality, you too are absorbed into the fiction. Elevator Repair Service didn't dramatize the great Gatsby. They manifested the drama that's inherent in the act of reading a novel. The real drama wasn't the story of Gatsby's love of Daisy or of his desperate attempt to escape his class or ethnic origins. The palpably dramatic thing was watching a reader become so engaged with a work of fiction that it subsumed his reality. It was ironically the anti-theatricality of the production, its insistence on reminding you that it was reciting to you a fictional text, a world that existed between the covers of a book that made the performance particularly affecting. There are other forms of potentially productive tension between fiction and performance that move in the other direction. Sometimes the tension appears in works of narrative fiction that are based on performances or created in collusion, collaboration, or even antagonism with performers or performances. You can also see it in fiction that incorporates or even enacts narrative theory. And perhaps most extremely, you can see it in textual experiments in producing performative fiction, narrative prose that doesn't merely denote action but makes things happen. These are not merely aesthetic efforts at blurring the boundaries between artistic practices. The performative novel pushes to its limit what, lang what written language can do, but it can only do it in collusion with a reader. Perhaps one of the most extreme instances of the novel's performativity is the case of David Markson, who in his final cycle of novels performed the most extreme act possible. Well, we've heard about some other extreme acts. Uh, he wrote himself to death, literally. After treatment for advanced lung cancer and an additional diagnosis of prostate cancer, Markson sat down to write. He knew the end point, his own death, and he meant to write his way there. He wasn't sure how long, how many novels it would take. It took four, and they were only novelistic in the most attenuated sense of the term. In fact, one of them somewhat pugnaciously asserted in its title, this is not a novel. By the time he came to the last one, he knew he'd get where he was going. He called it the last novel, and it was. But at the outset of the process, when it really wasn't clear how long this was going to take, Markson knew he had a certain block to get through. He also announced this problem in the title of the book. It wasn't writer's block. It was reader's block. The book begins with two epigraphs, the first from James Joyce. This is the way to the musy room. Mind your hats going in. The second is from Borges. First and foremost, I think of myself as a reader. It's funny that Markson even bothered with epigraphs because citational musings and readings of other authors' writings and lives make up the bulk of the book and also the three books that followed it. Markson's prolonged process of writing himself to death was also a process of reading himself to death. In fact, that's the story of Markson's life. And the reader that accompanies him is implicated in that act. The narrator of Reader's Block, who continues musing on whether what he's constructing can actually be called a novel, refers to himself alternately as Reader, with a capital R, and Protagonist, capital P, never Narrator. He doesn't tell you a story so much as allow for narration to emerge between the lines in your reading of them. The reader's block of the title appears to be the mountain of books he's read, the residue, as the jacket copy puts it, of a lifetime's reading, which is apparently all he has to show for his decades on Earth. Pondering not only the books he's read, but also the disastrous lives and ends of many of the writers he's loved, reader hints at, without ever telling, his own story. The presumably central relationships of his life with his wife, his lovers, his son and daughter, are only considered as possible challenges to the construction of the potential novel. 
if the writing prog progress can even be called that. The writing in progress can even be called that. Life, it seems, is a stumbling block in the love affair he really wants to tell, which is his intimate relationship with books. I'm going to read a long citation. Reader has come to this place because he had no life back there at all. Someone nodded hello to him on the street yesterday. Anna Akhmatova had an affair with Amadeo Modigliani in Paris in 1910 and 1911. Late in life, not having left Russia again in a third of a century, she would be astonished to learn how famous he had become. In 1579, when Shakespeare was 15, the population of Stratford would have been little more than 1,500. Is it a safe assumption that he knew the woman named Catherine Hamlet? who fell into the Avon that summer and drowned. Emily Dickinson became so extravagantly reclusive in the second half of her life that for the last 10 years, she did not once leave her home. Even among the most tentative first thoughts about a first draft, why is Reader thinking of his central character as Reader? What I just read is a half page near the beginning of Reader's Block, a fragment which will give you both the entire sense and no sense at all of the experience of reading the sequence of Markson's last novels. That is, the apparently random stacking up of literary anecdotes, the cataloging of bad reviews, suicidal ideation and sometimes acts, catastrophic finances and personal lives, and sometimes the shocking bigotry or bad judgment of beloved authors is interspersed with hints of Markson's own end. Cloudy x-rays of a lung, unpaid hospital bills, containers of prescription medications, an adamantly unringing telephone. As in durational performance art, bearing the duration of the non-narrative is intrinsic to experiencing the reading of Markson, though if I can't convince you to read all four volumes, I urge you to read the last novel, as it's only fair to help, him, help read him to death, as that's what he's asking you to do. I bought my, I almost brought it, but I didn't. I, I bought my copy of Reader's Block at the Strand Bookstore in New York, and it's a signed copy. Markson liked to walk the aisles of the Strand. If you don't know it, it's a famous bookstore that stocks both used and new books, thousands and thousands of them. The store's motto, in fact, is 18 miles of books. Walking the miles of aisles of the Strand is itself a durational act. Markson has something of a cult following, but he never had a vast readership. My signed copy sold for the regular cover price of $12.95, $12.95. In fact, it may have been on a markdown table. I don't really remember but I'm afraid I missed the real opportunity to find reader properly at the Strand. I missed my chance, but not everyone did. A student of mine alerted it to me shortly after Markson's death. He read about it on a blog. Somebody had accidentally discovered fragments of reader's life in the cheap used book bins out on the sidewalk in front of the Strand. It was, the blogger said, a shock. And now I'm going to quote again at some length. This is from the blog. A shock, in part, because Markson's work relied so heavily on other books. Schoenberg's Lives of the Great Composers, I paid $7.50 for Markson's copy. Wittgenstein's Correspondence, Paul Engelman's Letters uh, from Wittgenstein with a Memoir, $12.50. Robert Graves' edition of The Greek Myths, $30 for the two-volume Penguin Hardback. There are too many inscribed books for any one civilian to buy. Most have notes, check marks, underlined passages. I guess that a few of them, especially the more heavily annotated ones, belong in a proper archive. And yet, here they are, hundreds of hardbacks. The only paperback I could find was a copy of Walter Abish's How German Is, is It, sent to Mark Markson with the author's compliments. Some of them with price tags covering Markson's name, as if the buyers were afraid that his signature would somehow diminish their value. I'd heard about the hall from Jeff Seavers, who teaches at the University of British Columbia. This is still from the blog. He'd heard about it from a student who'd stumbled on Markson's copy of Don DeLillo's White Noise. And now I quote from the 
student quoted in the blog. My copy of White Noise apparently used to belong to David Markson, who I had to look up, the student had written. He wrote some notes in the margin, a check mark by some passages, no by others, bullshit or ugh, get to the point by others. I wanted to call him up and tell him his notes are funny, but then I realized he died a month ago. Bummer. That's amazing, Jeff had replied. Did he write his name in the front or something? Did you buy it secondhand recently? As in, his family sold off his library? Yeah, he wrote his name inside the front cover, and the cashiers at the Strand said they have his whole collection. Favorite comments? Oh, God, the pomposity, the bullshit. Oh, I get it. It's a sci-fi novel and big deal. That night, this is still from the blog, I put $262.81 on the credit card and, bought, and brought three shopping bags home to my fourth floor walk-up. Juna Barnes's Nightwood, $7.50. Yates's Essays and Introductions, $15. Leslie Fiedler's Life and Death in the American Novel, $10. Tristram Shandy, $5, 27 books in all. My new collection includes old modern library editions, Joyce, Kafka, Balzac, Pater, Lao Tse, and Tacitus, undergraduate philosophy texts. The future novelist paid more attention to Kant and Hume than Erasmus, Descartes, and Hegel, and Joyce's selected letters with brackets around the dirty bits. Thanks to Markson, I now own Stephen Joyce's Modern Library edition of Gogol's Dead Souls. A gift? Did Markson borrow the book and fail to return it? Or did he run across it himself on a visit to the Strand and wonder how it had ended up there? Thus ends the blog entry. There was some hue and cry when the Markson non-collection situation came to light. A lot of people wondered why an important university hadn't been contacted to see if somebody might want to archive his personal library. When the administrative staff, staff at the Strand was contacted, they seemed a little embarrassed, but noted that Markson had merely left his books to the store without indicating any desire for them to be retained as a collection. In fact, in all likelihood, his books ended up dispersed exactly as he wanted them among the various arbitrary readers to whom each book called out. There are hints in reader's block that he was considering all of this. On page 61, after a brief reference to Beckett, reader writes, in an apartment in far west Greenwich Village, heat, Malloy, Malone, Estragon, sorting books and records, determining which he may dispose of before departing after all, end quote. On page 74, are any of the books protagonist is packing inscribed by their authors, or are those the ones he's more likely selling for their added value? End quote. My own signed copy of Reader's Block is dog-eared on precisely those pages. Who is the reader who will one day wonder why another reader dog-eared those pages? Uh, this is a little insertion. <laughs> to my paper. As I was reading this paper over in preparation for delivering it to you today, I realized something. For a long time, there was one detail about reader's block that perplexed me. Reader slash protagonist lives a few blocks from my house in Greenwich Village. But in the book, he's pondering placing the narrative, as little of it as there is, in two houses one next to a cemetery, the other on a beach. The house near the cemetery made sense to me. He was dwelling near death. But why the beach? Then it dawned on me. In English, another term for the beach is the strand. When reader ambles along the beach, he's ambling the strand. When I realized that, I felt like David Markson had left a tiny, faint note in the margin intended just for my understanding. I may be wrong, but I'm passing the private message on to you. The story of David Markson's writing to death and the subsequent dispersal of his literary remains seems to suggest that performative writing is ultimately a diffuse project with little noticeable impact in the real world. Of course, we've been talking about that all morning. 
but the political stakes of such experiments are perhaps higher than they may seem. In 1986, my former colleague, the great Kenyan writer and political activist, Ngugi Wationgo, published a novel in Kikuyu called Matigari. It was a work of penetrating political satire, indicting political corruption and demagoguery in a post-colonial state. Ngugi opens that book with these lines of direct address to you. This story is imaginary. The actions are imaginary. The characters are imaginary. The country is imaginary. It has no name even. Reader, listener, may the story take place in the country of your choice. Still, Kenyan readers had no difficulty in placing it in Daniel Arab Moy's Kenya. And because of the rarity of a novel being published in an African language, and because of its relevance to their lives, a lot of Kenyans were talking about and taking inspiration from the title character of the novel, a messianic figure in opposition to state oppression. Daniel Arab Moy also had no difficulty finding dangerous allegorical implications in the pronouncement of the novel's hero. In fact, Matigari was so threatening, Moy issued a warrant for his arrest. Really. Matigari was a fictional character. They tried to arrest him. Almost 20 years later, in the mountains of Chiapas, Mexico, Subcomandante Marcos made a similar move in the opposite direction. Already an outlaw, wanted by the state, Marcos, collaborating through correspondence with the well-known crime novelist Paco Ignacio Taibo II, turned himself in to a fictional character in The Uncomfortable Dead. Narrating alternate chapters through the voice of Elias Contreras, an indigenous sleuth working for the EZLN, Marcos depicted himself as the mysterious, self-satirizing figure he'd already popularized through his non-fictional but intensely fabulous in the sense of narratively compressed and highly allegorical political writings. Taibo's chapters were genre fiction, the hard-boiled detective framework he was already famous for. But the real mystery of the book wasn't about how to apprehend singular murderers. It was about how to respond to the structural violence of neoliberalism. The answer was implicit in the text itself. This is something we've also talked about today the need to recognize the narratives of capitalist progress for what they are, dangerous and manipulative fictions. These kinds of actions demonstrate the literal performativity of fiction, that is, its ability to make things happen in the real world. In the realm of politics, the blurry boundaries between performance, fiction, and reality seem practically a given but we don't often consider the, real, the very real role that fictions can play. Before Occupy, before the Arab Spring, before Pussy Riot, Subcomandante Marcos was arguably the most influential political activist to access the political potential of storytelling. But unlike Ngugi, who suggestively titled one of his political tracts, The Barrel of a Pen, Marcos chose to disperse his stories through new media, his internet communiques are his most dangerous weapon. And since he first appeared, emerging pl performance platforms, particularly social networking platforms, are, as we know, revolutionizing, well, revolutionary practice. But they're also expanding the possibilities for more generally blurring the lines between fiction and reality. R. Samora Linmark, a queer-identified Filipino-American writer, recently pu published a novel called Leche. The central character, Vince de los Reis, has his own Twitter account, and he tweets, the character tweets. Lindmark says that he wanted for Vince to tweet in order to, quote, dramatize the creative process. This phrase would seem to bear a relation to the dramatization of the reading process in the work of Elevator Repair Service. Characters can have a life, Lindmark says, even after their story has been written. I attempted something similar myself when I was preparing for the publication of my first novel, The Correspondence Artist. The text repeatedly insists on the unreliability of its narrator, who tells you that all four of the central characters are fictional constructions of her lover, 
a single, ostensibly real person with whom she's carrying on a clandestine email correspondence. A love affair that mostly takes place through letters is a particular kind of love affair. And epistolary fiction, which ostensibly reproduces the erotic contact established through text, effectively invites the reader to participate in erotic acts. Reading erotic exchanges is intensely intimate. The lover directly addresses you. You not only identify with the dear reader, you are he or she. Lacan would tell us that any object of erotic desire is, in fact, a fiction. And precisely to drive home the fictional nature of any real paramour, I let each of the four fictional characters in my novel set up his or her own email and YouTube accounts. They each posted a variety of performances, radio interviews, musical interpretations, experimental videos, and in one case, a livid philosophical political communique. This version of the paramour, a Basque separatist named Santucho Echeverria, was actually based on Marcos, as perhaps you'll understand when you see this. I'm about to show a video. He was, uh, that is my character, was somewhat affronted by the suggestion in my novel that he went to a dinner party with Slavoj Žižek. Uh, so I'll screen you the video that he posted on YouTube in response to that. This is a YouTube video because I want to clarify one thing. I don't know how to make big. I never had dinner with Slavo Žižek. And furthermore, Slavo Žižek is a horse's ass. That's Santucho. Yep. How do I go back to the... Oh, I get there. I bet this is it. No? Crucial. Yeah. yeah. I'm okay. Thank you. Perhaps, for contrast's sake, I should show you another video, this one posted by Duong Van Bin, a different version of my narrator's fictional lover who makes short experimental films. This one's very short. Oops. No. Sorry, down here? There. I can, we can make it big, yeah. It's very short. <laughs> it's a worm. So that's on Duong's, uh, Duong Van Bin's. Okay. Yeah, it's repeating. How do I go back? There we go. It will be three, but not, oh, just let me introduce for one second. Um, in my subsequent novel, I'm trying to reach you, my narrator, Gray Adams, becomes somewhat obsessed with an aging ballerina who posts bewildering dance videos to YouTube. The narrator begins to suspect that these dances are clues to a murder mystery, and I'll show you one, and you may find the fictional dancer a little familiar. This is the last video I'll show. Come back. Um, there's a whole series of 12 of these, and they serve as clues to the murder mystery in the novel, or at least the narrator believes that they're clues. Um, the address of the website holding these 12 videos that I mentioned was indicated in the text, 
And although viewing the dances wasn't necessary for a reader to negotiate the book, I hoped readers would go there because it would place them in exactly the perplexing viewer's position that was occupied by my narrator. Creating the dances was contingent on, on my writing the novel, but their activation in the world, my capacity to perform in both literal and theoretical senses of the term, was contingent on my readers. I was asking you, as reader, to play my narrator. This became an issue when we talked about the e-book because we didn't know if there should be live links, and I sort of preferred the idea that a person would need to leave the book and go to the computer and go to YouTube, actually, which is, as many of you know, kind of a wild west space of strange and hostile comments and so on and so forth. So I actually wanted for people to, to go through that process. But performances <clears throat> don't only emerge from fiction. Fictional narratives can emerge from or respond to performances, other people's performances. Paul Auster's novel Leviathan famously based a character on the conceptual performance art pieces of Sophie Kahl. Yeah. Thank you. Of Sophie Kahl, whom he thanked in the introduction for, quote, permission to mingle fact with fiction. She may have given permission, but she evidently wasn't content to serve merely as material for Auster's novel. She subsequently extended her fictional persona, Maria, into further performances that seemed to take an increasingly cannibalistic attitude toward Auster's novel, and arguably toward Auster himself. And I use the term cannibalistic here with the greatest of tenderness. She pressed him to write more of her life so that she could live out the fiction in reality. Or was it art? She also published her own book, Double Game, which I believe is part of your collection, which chronicled her performances prior to their fictionalization by Auster. Her own critical readings of his text, she reproduces the marginalia in her copy of Leviathan, and the performances that came out of the experience of becoming a fictional character. Her marginalia could largely be characterized as caustic, and here I'll just also mention that she had a subsequent project called Prenez Soin de Vous, in which she asked 107, is that also part of your, no? Part of your project, no? Prenez Soin de Vous, she asked 107 women to read, that is, interpret the breakup email that her boyfriend sent her, you know, uh, by text. And so 107 women, women broadly construed, it includes a bird and some other creatures and a machine. Um, and they interpret, read the email for Sophie and turn those into part of the, lar the, the large performance, which is the collection of all of these interpretations. Call's explicit follower, experimental filmmaker, novelist, and cultural critic Chris Krauss took a similar tack in her novel, I Love Dick, but here the performances inspiring the fictional apparatus were her own. Lovesick, obsessive, neurotic, often threatening letters she compulsively composed, sometimes with the co collaboration of her French theorist husband, uh, Sylvain L'Otranger, to the rock star subculture critic Dick Hebdige, who claims to have had only passing and superficial contact with the author. The reason I draw your attention to Krauss, aside, I, I believe many people in this audience are probably already familiar with her work, aside from liking to turn people on to this disconcerting, wacky kind of brilliant book, is that it's a book that not only blurs the line between performance and fiction, but also performance theory and fiction. In fact, at a couple of points in the text, the character of Silver Lautranger argues to the character of Dick that he really ought to take the author or should I say author, Chris Krauss, seriously, because while her text may look alarmingly stalkerish, he should, he should surely acknowledge that Chris has invented, and I quote, something in between cultural criticism and fiction, some new kind of literary form. I Love Dick is only interesting, though, if one recognizes it as a work of fiction. That is, if you read it simply as a compulsive, stalkerish, neurotic, confessional narrative, it's interesting in a kind of vulgar way, but it gets really theoretically interesting when Krauss is pushing you to contemplate the performance of academic rock stardom and the fictional construction of erotic and intellectual cathexis. Sheila Hetty's How Should a Person Be clearly takes a page from Chris Krauss. 
In the novel, Hetty also reproduces correspondence with a friend who displays ample discomfort with the idea of her own cannibalization in Hetty's text. But the chairs are where the people go is Hetty's most extreme act of literary cannibalization. It has everything to do with what Simon was talking about yesterday. In that book, Hetty transcribes the rambling, interesting, and yet seemingly aimless, spontaneous monologues of a friend, Misha Glauberman. He and Hetty are listed as co-authors, but basically, Hetty's only intervention was transcription. In Kenneth Goldsmith's terms, her contribution was utterly uncreative, and yet for Glauberman, it was essential. He doesn't consider himself a writer. He's a performance artist. Sheila played the role of writer, although what she was doing was what most people would call listening. A month ago, I attended a performance which one might once again call a dramatization of the performative act of reading. It was called The Library, and indeed, the production of it that I attended was held at the Jefferson Market Library in my neighborhood in Greenwich Village. It was composed by the choreographer Fanny Duchayet in collaboration with the French Institute Alliance Francaise. Fanny Duchayet recruited a number of human books that one could check out and then return. These books were individuals. This is sort of related to what Ingo was talking about, the desire for storytelling, perhaps specific to New York, I'm not sure. These books were individuals who responded to Chayet's, to Chayet's call for people who wanted to tell their stories. When I arrived at the library, there was a small card catalog listing the holdings available that day. There were no descriptions of the stories to be told, but I chose one with a perky title, Oh Mickey, You're So Fine. The author's name now escapes me. I'm kicking myself that I didn't write it down, but I remember that her last name began with the letter J. I was, unsurprisingly, led to a chair in the J section of the alphabetically organized fiction section. An empty seat was facing me, and I was told that my book would join me soon. And indeed, moments later, an affable young woman appeared, wearing a plain white t-shirt with her title across her chest. She sat on the chair, and without so much as a handshake or a personal introduction, she launched into a 20-minute anecdote regarding the way she got to her current employment situation, working as a copywriter for a major clothing manufacturer whose CEO was named Mickey. Mickey, in the story, didn't actually sound particularly fine, but he did sound idiosyncratic and amusing, and the 20 minutes passed very quickly. When she finished, she smiled, got up, and went away. It was weird. She'd shared some personal information, she'd looked directly into my eyes, but she hadn't asked me anything. The notice regarding the performance had indicated that Duchayet was interested in taking readers back to a more intimate kind of encounter with stories. And yet this felt oddly less intimate than my usual experience of reading. I liked the young woman. She was personable, her story was entertaining, there was a bit of suspense, I certainly wanted to stay until the end, but I felt utterly uncalled by her. Books often make me feel much more complicit than this. De Chayet seemed to be implying that the increasing mediatization of our world meant that we were often entering into dehumanized relationships with text. And yet this face-to-face -face encounter felt very abstract. Ironically, the more literal the performance of my book, the less I was able to perform as a reader, it made me a little sad. When I was preparing this paper, knowing that I'd be addressing an audience not only of book lovers, but also of art lovers, I decided to see what kinds of artistic images were circulating not of books or even of authors, but of readers. If you do a Google image search of reader, I can tell you this, you don't need to go home and do it, it's really boring. You end up with a plethora of electronic devices. Provoked by my epigraph from Baudelaire, I decided to see if the same thing happened with lecteur. Yes. Then I wondered, what about gender? What happens if I try lectrice? Bingo. Nearly every image was erotic. Some pornographic others merely suggestive. 
And here, now that I've said that, maybe you'd like to see a few. There's a large number, now I'm going to put them up. Uh, let's see, to get to my, sorry. Uh, oh, it's here? Right here? Yeah. Okay, and then I go make a slideshow. Perfect, thank you, okay. And just use the arrows, okay. So there's a large number of shots from uh, Michel Deville's film La Lectrice. This is one. Uh, starring Miu Miu as a woman who reads love to men. Uh, now I'm just going to very quickly show you what some of the other images are. These are all represent... This is a really representational spread of the different kinds of lectrices that you will find. All erotic. All. Or romantic. Mostly erotic. Why, I wondered, is it women who are understood to read love the way that we say we make love? A friend suggested that perhaps the relative historical newness of women's education in a global context still makes a literate woman a dangerous, and so perhaps erotically, makes a, a, a literate woman a dangerous and so perhaps erotically compelling subject. Maybe. Among all the images I found, there was only one woman of color. I, I didn't go to the very end of the Google images, but I went pretty far, and this was the one image. How you read her image is perhaps even more overdetermined. In the writing lesson, a small, poignant, sometimes funny, but also devastating section of his most novelistic work that was invoked by Tom just a little bit ago, Tris Tropique, Claude Lévi-Strauss considers the global history of literacy and concludes with this counterintuitive and very disconcerting conclusion. I quote, the only phenomenon with which writing has always been concomitant is the creation of cities and empires. That is, the integration of large numbers of individuals into a political system and their grading into castes or classes. Such, at any rate, is the typical pattern of development to be observed from Egypt to China at the time when writing first emerged. It seems to have favored the exploitation of human beings rather than their enlightenment. My hypothesis, this is Levi-Strauss speaking, my hypothesis, if correct, would oblige us to recognize the fact that the primary function of written communication is to facilitate slavery. That's the end of the quotation. Although, as Ngugi and Marcos would have it, it's also our most potent weapon against oppression. It's also one of the most potent forms of intimate engagement we have access to, whether that means it allows us to read love to a man or to read him to death. Uh, and I have one other insertion uh, that occurred to me playing the reader to my own text as I prepared to come here today. This is where my paper ends, but again, in playing my own reader or listener, a question occurred to me. Barbara, I asked, what's the most famous direct address to the reader in English literature? And of course, I answered, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Reader, I married him. I've been using the term performative as though we have a common understanding of it, but for those of you unfamiliar with its use in linguistic theory and consequently in performance theory, I should pause to say that the linguistic philosopher J.L. Austin used the term to refer to, as I hinted, language that actually changes something in the world. And his exemplary performative utterance is the marriage vow. When the bride says, I do, something has irrevocably changed about her status in the world, which would perhaps indicate that the primary function of performative language like that of writing, according to Levi-Strauss, is to facilitate slavery. But when Jane Eyre addresses the reader, it's not to report 
he married me, or even I was married. Feminist readers tend to emphasize the agency of her phrasing, I married him. Just as her childhood reading led Jane to social conscience, she, she reads about the Roman slaves and that thus and understands the injustice of her own familiar, familial power struggle, as you'll remember. Her embrace of the performative utterance is one she only takes in her own terms, which is, of course, the only way to read, write, or perform language. That's the end. Oh, yeah, that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture. If someone has a question to Barbara. I asked my own, so. <laughs> David. <laughs> Thank you for bringing us to this gender uh, issue. I think it's very interesting. Gender and, and race, I think, is yeah. another. Yeah, race is something good to think about. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, well, this is not exactly a question, but I, <clears throat> I found very interesting when you said that after your experience with this reading piece, this uh, library, the library, yeah? The more literal the performance of a book, the less one is engaged uh, as a reader. I found that very interesting because actually it seems like the artist was trying to give, uh, to give something, yeah, to make a gift to the to the visitor to the performance. But it seems like the effect was reversed, yeah, like you get less. For me, I don't I don't know if all readers experienced it that way. I, it, it seemed a little strange to, to encounter a person face to face and, and have it unidirectional to that degree. But, yeah. But you mean because maybe you were more of a passive receiver? You were not yeah. reading, you were not performing the text, somebody was doing it, it for really, you? It really, yeah, it felt very much like it was delivered as opposed to a kind of a collaborative exchange, yeah. Uh, but as I said, that might be idiosyncratic. I'm not sure if all readers experience that. No. No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. <laughs>